unpredictable conduction of disordered impulses across the electrical bridge called the AV node to the lower cardiac chambers ventricles. The arrhythmia also results in ineffectual atrial contraction affecting cardiac output and vulnerability to blood clot or thrombus formation that can result in stroke events. According to 2014 R and ACC guideline, F can be classified based on the duration of episode. Paroxysmal atrial fibrillation refers to atrial fibrillation that begins suddenly and ends spontaneously within seven days of onset. Persistent atrial fibrillation refers atrial fibrillation that occurs for longer than seven days and ends spontaneously or with treatment. Long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation refers to patients who have uninterrupted AF for more than a year. Permanent atrial fibrillation refers to AF that persists despite treatment to restore normal sinus rhythm or that is not treated. These atrial fibrillation classifications are not mutually exclusive and it is common for patients with one type of atrial fibrillation to exhibit overlapping features of another type. These classifications are relevant clinically with respect to outcomes and prognosis and with rhythm controlling treatment strategies. Atrial fibrillation is commonly associated with other supraventricular arrhythmias, namely atrial flutter and focal atrial tachycardia. <laughs> Prevalence. Atrial fibrillation is the most common sustained cardiac tachyarrhythmia encountered by clinicians worldwide. An estimated 2.7 to 6.1 million people in US have atrial fibrillation with projections to reach nearly 12 million in 2030. The prevalence of atrial fibrillation increases with age. It affects 10% of population by 80 years of age. The growing prevalence may be influenced by extended survival outcome for patients with congestive heart failure, valvular heart disease, and coronary artery disease, as AF is a common among patients with other forms of spectral heart disease. Pathophysiology of atrial fibrillation. Actual fibrillation may be acutely associated with some physiological stressors, such as surgical procedures, particularly cardiac surgery, pulmonary embolism, chronic lung disease, hyperthyroidism or thyrotoxicosis, and alcohol ingestion. Disease states commonly associated with actual fibrillation include rheumatic valvular heart diseases, congestive heart failure, coronary artery disease, hypertension, WPW syndrome, pericarditis, obstructive sleep apnea, and cardiomyopathy. Considerable research has been devoted to the mechanisms and pathogenesis of atrial fibrillation. Genetic studies have identified a specific association, particularly in the cases of familial atrial fibrillation. Achieving a complete understanding of atrial fibrillation is limited by the complexity of this disorder and the heterogeneous patient population it affects. The pathogenesis of atrial fibrillation can be broadly divided into the categories of triggers, some substrate, and some sustaining mechanisms. Since the late 1990s, it has been recognized that the initiation of atrial fibrillation can occur because of premature atrial contraction which is triggered by beats that arises from the pulmonary vein, particularly junction of pulmonary vein and left atrium, usually from muscular tissue slips near the junction of the left atrium. These triggers may also fire repeatedly and contribute to maintenance of atrial fibrillation, especially becoming the drivers of atrial fibrillation. Focal triggers outside the pulmonary vein are uncommon but include posterior left atrium, ligament of Marshall, coronary sinus, superior vena cava, interatrial septum, left atrial appendage. Focal triggers, especially pulmonary veins, are felt to be very important early in the disease process and particular among patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Over time, myocardial fibrosis develops within the atrial tissue in association with atrial fibrillation to support its maintenance 
by shortening the effective tissue reflector period. Myocardial fibrosis of the actium seems to be the common feature of progression of atrial fibrillation disease states. This has led to the adage that atrial fibrillation begets atrial fibrillation. Once atrial fibrillation is initiated by focal triggers, several theories have been postulated to explain the maintenance of atrial fibrillation. They include the multiple wavelet model, atrial fibrillation rotors, and the role of autonomic nervous system. The multiple wavelet model has suggested that AF is sustained by multiple simultaneous wavelets meandering throughout the atria. Atrial tissue with abnormal electrical propagation recorded by mapping catheters has been referred to as complex fractionated electrograms. Expression of a specific connecting protein channels at the cellular level are also felt to be important contributors to the disease substrate and sustaining mechanisms. Contemporary understanding of the atrial fibrillation substrate and sustaining mechanisms now also includes the role of autonomic nervous system. More commonly, the discovery and evaluation of the concept of atrial fibrillation rotors. Cardiac ganglionic plexus clustered posteriorly and superiorly to the left atrium are known to play an important role. Both parasympathetic and sympathetic limbs can provoke the atrial arrhythmias. Evidence supportive of this concept also non-cardiac plexus, including the stellate ganglion and perinephric ganglia associated with the renal arches. In addition, completely vagally denervated hearts, as in heart transplantation, are known to have a very low incidence of atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation rotors represent an emerging concept as a sustaining mechanism for atrial fibrillation involving spiral waves detected by spectral analysis of dominant frequencies recorded by intracardiac mapping catheter. Such spiral waves can be conceptualized as wavelets of consistent electrical activation around a central localized source that could be either structural or purely functional. The focal impulse and rotor modulation computational mapping system is used to identify the atrial fibrillation rotors. Atrial fibrillation may have hemodynamic consequences. It can decrease the cardiac output due to ineffectual atrial systole and increase the pulmonary venous pressure, resulting in pulmonary edema. Deleterious hemodynamic effects also include non-physiologic tachycardia, increased valvular regurgitation, and irregularity in ventricular systole. AF is associated with morbidity and even mortality. AF can produce bothersome symptoms and that affect quality of life. But patients with AF also have a substantial risk of thromboembolic stroke. AF is associated with a five-fold increased risk of a stroke, three-fold risk of heart failure, and two-fold risk of dementia and mortality. Some data demonstrate an association of actual fibrillation with reduced overall survival. Now, signs and symptoms of atrial fibrillation. Clinical manifestation of atrial fibrillation are variable. Although fatigue is the most common symptom, often the symptoms are attributed to the rapid ventricular response. However, even when the ventricular response is controlled, symptoms can occur from loss of avicin crony or atrial systole. This is particularly important for patients with left ventricular dysfunction that is congestive heart failure and the impaired diastolic feeling in mitral stenosis, hypertrophic and restrictive cardiomyopathy. That said, some patients with atrial fibrillation are genuinely asymptomatic even at rapid heart rates for unclear regions. More often, however, patients report non-specific symptoms such as fatigue, dyspnea, dizziness, and diaporesis. Palpitation is the most common symptom of atrial fibrillation. Occasionally, patients present with extreme manifestations of hemodynamic compromise, such as chest pain, pulmonary edema, or syncope. Atrial fibrillation is present in 10% to 40% patients with a new thromboembolic stroke. 
diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. Stop every block or with a ventricular phase. A 12 bleed ECG is best to establish the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, absence of POH, and the presence of low amplitude, high frequency atrial fibrillatory wave or F wave. The atrial rate varies in range of 300 to 700 beats per minute. In the absence of drug therapy, a patient with normal AV conduction has an irregularly irregular ventricular rhythm and often has a ventricular rate in the range of 120 to 180 beats per minute. The baseline on the ECG step often is undulating and occasionally has force irregular activity. This activity may resemble atrial flutter, but it is not as uniform way to wait as atrial flutter. You see in some ECG, Upper left, typical atrial flutter. Upper right, multifocal atrial tachycardia. Lower left, atrial fibrillation. And lower right, WPW syndrome. Treatment of atrial fibrillation. Most patients presenting with atrial fibrillation are not critically ill. However, in some cases, the presence of atrial fibrillation may cause life threatening hemodynamic compromise. It should be emphasized that for any unstable patient presenting with atrial fibrillation, for example, a patient with chest pain, pulmonary edema, or hypotension, the recommended to advanced cardiovascular life support guidelines. Atrial fibrillation has particular importance in the setting of WPW syndrome. Patients with WPW syndrome may be vulnerable to ventricular fibrillation and sudden death because of the development of atrial fibrillation, which can result in extremely rapid conduction over the accessory pathway. Prompt electrical cardioversion is of utmost importance for these patients. Treatment with AV node blocking medication, such as varafamil or digoxin or beta blocker, can facilitate rapid conduction over the accessory pathway and result in ventricular fibrillation. So this AB nodal blocking drug must be avoided in patient of WPW syndrome present with atrial fibrillation. When intravenous pharmacologic therapy is required, drug of choice is cocainamide or amiodarone. There are three goals in the management of atrial fibrillation, control of ventricular rate, minimization of thromboembolic stroke, and restoration and maintenance of sinus rhythm. First two goals are essential for most patients, but the third goal may not be necessary in all patients. Control of ventricular rate. Rate control in patients with atrial fibrillation is essential to reduce the symptoms and improve the quality of life. The optimal heart rate goal has not been fully defined and may be patient specific. In the race to clinical trial, patients were randomly assigned to a stick that is less than 80 bit per minute versus lenient, less than 110 bit per minute control strategies. Lenient rate control was not inferior to strict rate control in terms of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality in this trial. Based on this study, European Society of Cardiology guidelines incorporated the lenient rate control strategy as the first-line approach to asymptomatic patients with preserved cardiac function. However, the guidelines from AHA ACC favor a more stringent rate control strategy. Guideline statements only address the goal in patients with preserved cardiac function. The optimal rate in patients with heart failure has not been fully defined. 
For example, some studies show that in patients with heart failure, a slow ventricular rates are associated with higher mortality and higher ventricular rates may be needed to improve the exercise tolerance. However, patients with heart failure can easily become decompensated when ventricular rates are uncontrolled. Hence, most clinicians use a patient-specific window of optimal rate control that avoids the consequences of both extreme bradycardia and tachycardia. Ventricular slowing is accomplished with medications affecting the AV node. The most commonly used drug clutches are beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. Most patients with persistent atrial fibrillation appeal in the pocket. Rate control strategy has been proposed in patients with a low burden of self terminating atrial fibrillation. Though no studies have been investigated this strategy. If these medications are ineffective or if excessive bradycardia occurs, other measures may need to be considered. One option suitable for some patients is catheter ablation of AV node and pacemaker implantation, that is ablate and pace. Meta-analysis of the ablate and pace approach has demonstrated improvements in a number of clinical parameters, including symptoms, quality of life, exercise function, cardiac performance, and longevity in patients with congestive heart failure receiving a biventricular pacemaker. However, this approach usually results in pacemaker dependence and carries the associated risk and complication of indwelling pacemaker leads. Pacemaker implantation without a venoral application should be considered if the problem is simply excessive bradycardia. That prohibits the effectiveness of rate controlling medication. And the rapid ventricular rates are well controlled by medication. For patients with abnormal LV systolic function, a biventricular pacemaker such as CRT should be considered in conjunction with AV nodal ablation based on the results of the block heart failure trial. Drugs for atrial fibrillation that slow the conduction through the AV node. Number one, beta blocker, advantage. Intravenous administration produces a rapid onset of effect. Heart rate control at rest and with activity, oral forms available. These advantage may worsen the heart failure in decompensated patient, may exacerbate reactive airway disease, cause fatigue, depression, and impotence. Abrupt withdrawal may cause rebound tachycardia, hypertension, and myocardial ischemia. Among the beta blockers, propanolol. Intravenous 1 mg bolus, repeat every 5 minutes as needed to achieve the goal, onset of action in 5 minutes. Oral immediate release, 10 to 30 mg every 6 or 8 hours daily, onset of action in 1 to 2 hours. Oral extended release, 80 to 160 mg daily, onset of action in 1 to 2 hours. And duration is 6 to 24 hours, depending on form. Metoprolol, intravenous. 2.5 to 5 milligram every 2 to 3 minutes as need to achieve goal. Onset of action is in 5 minutes and duration of action is 1 to 3 hours. Oral immediate till is 12.5 to 100 milligram every 6 to 8 hours. Onset of action in 1 to 2 hours and duration of action is 3 to 24 hours depending on form. Oral extended release 50 to 400 milligram once daily. Onset of action is in 1 to 2 hours and duration of action to 24 hours. A small all intravenous form only, 500 mics per kg over one minute. Then maintenance dose, 25 to 300 mics per kg per minute. Tracted by 25 to 50 mics per kg per minute every 5 to 10 minutes to achieve the goal. Onset of action in 2 to 10 minutes and duration of action is 9 minutes apply. Calcium channel blocker. Advantage, intravenous administration produces a rapid onset of effect, heart rate control at rest and with activity, oral forms available. Disadvantage may worsen the heart failure in decompensated patient, may cause fatigue, edema and constipation. 
among the calcium channel blocker non dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker first one deal kiya gem intravenous 0.25 Milligram per kg over two minutes, then five to fifty milligram per hour. May repeat the bolus of zero point three five milligram per hour. Not achieved. Onset of action in five minutes. Duration of effect is one to ten hours. Oral immediate release thirty to one twenty milligram every six to eight hours. Onset of action one hour. Duration of effect five to twenty four hours. Oral extended release one twenty to three sixty milligram once daily. Onset of action in one hour. And duration of effect five to twenty four hours. Barapamil intravenous initial bolus point zero seven five to point one five milligram per kg. Usual dose five to ten milligram over at least two minutes. If no response, may give in an additional ten milligram bolus after fifteen to thirty minutes. Onset of action in three to five minutes. Duration of action is point five to six hours. Oral immediate release eighty to one twenty milligram every eight to twelve hours. To a maximum of 480 milligram per day, onset of action in one to two hours, duration of action six to eight hours. Oral extended release 180 to 480 milligram once daily, onset of action in one to two hours, and duration of action is six to eight hours. Other a benign blocking drug is digoxin. Advantage can be used in patient with heart failure. Useful in combination with other a benign blocking drug. Disadvantage: a slow onset of action, poor control of heart rate with activity, narrow therapeutic margin, long duration of effect. Not recommended as monotherapy under practice guidelines. Intravenous dose: loading dose of up to one milligram in first 24 hours with bolus of 0.25 to 0.5 milligram, then remainder in divided doses six to eight hours. Onset of action in five to 60 minutes. Duration of effect three to four days. Oral dose: 0.125 to 0.25 milligram daily. Onset of action in one to two hours. A special situation in a rate control. In patient with an implantable cardioverter defibrillator, great care is needed in both the device programming and pharmacologic rate control in order to avoid the risk of inappropriate shocks associated with rapid ventricular rates. In patient with a cardiac desynchronization therapy device, the goal is to achieve 100% by ventricular pacing. If the presence of atrial fibrillation prevents the achievement of this goal, further consideration of rhythm control strategies. Rhythm. Further consideration to rhythm controlling strategies or a venoral ablation is recommended. Preventing thromboembolism and stroke risk. Atrial fibrillation carries a considerable risk for, for thromboembolism and stroke. The Framingham study has shown that during a follow-up period of 30 years, patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation had a more than five-fold risk of stroke, and the risk of stroke attributed to a stroke increased with age. Ischemic stroke can be the first manifestation. Of occult atrial fibrillation, which is also referred to as subclinical atrial fibrillation, ischemic strokes related to atrial fibrillation tend to be associated with greater morbidity and mortality than from other causes of stroke. As the crystal atrial fibrillation and MRS trials have demonstrated, atrial fibrillation is frequently detected. <laughs> Excuse me. Hello. Hello. Sir, sir, do you hear? Do you hear? Yes, sir. Do you hear? Yes, sir. As the crystal atrial, okay. As the crystal atrial fibrillation and embryonic trials have demonstrated. Atrial fibrillation is frequently detected in patients during post-stroke. Cardiac rhythm monitoring in patients with post-stroke stroke. Sometimes, sir, 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 s
सॉरी हेलो ना सर बोलें सर क्लास टेन सर मिल कर दी चीज़ सर शब्द के सार शब्द अच्छी लो सार है ओके इस दर एनी प्रॉब्लम ना सर कोन कोन प्रॉब्लम नहीं सार ओके सम डेटा साजेस दैट साच एसिम्प्टोमेटिक एक्चुअल पीपलेशन कैन कैरी ए वर्स प्रोग्नोसिस ostensibly related to the stroke risk incurred without the presence of symptoms to provide a warning the annual risk of a stroke may be even higher in patient with atrial fibrillation who have one or more of the following risk factors patient older than 65 years female patient diabetes hypertension heart failure coronary artery disease previous stroke or transient ischemic attack individual stroke this stratification can now be calculated for patients on the basis of the presence or absence of such risk factors known as tas score and tas mas score several strategies including antithrombotic therapy with vitamin k antagonist direct oral anticoagulant antiplatelet therapy with aspirin dipyridamol and clopidogrel direct oral anticoagulant drugs including factor 10 inhibitors such as epixaban rivaroxaban and direct thrombin inhibitors they get done in meta analysis vitamin k antagonist reduced stroke or systemic thromboembolism by 64% and all cause mortality by 26% compared with placebo the oral anticoagulants offers an additional risk reduction of 19% for a stroke or systemic thromboembolism primarily driven by reduction in hemorrhagic stroke and 10% for mortality relative to warfarin the combination of warfarin and aspirin increases the bleeding risk Warfarin is superior to aspirin, and also the combination of aspirin and clopidogrel in stroke prevention. Aspirin and clopidogrel is superior to aspirin alone in stroke protection among patients that are warfarin ineligible, but is associated with greater bleeding. Yes, I mentioned regarding the form of antithrombotic therapy for patients with atrial fibrillation. The AHA ACC guidelines recommend the child is moderate or high risk for thromboembolism. A score of zero is considered low risk and does not require not antithrombotic therapy. A score of two or greater is considered high risk, and antithrombotic therapy with vitamin K antagonist or new or oral anticoagulants should be considered. A score of one is considered moderate risk for which antithrombotic therapy. should be considered the goal of warfarin therapy for preventing stroke and thromboembolism from atrial fibrillation generally is an international normalized ratio between 2 and 3 the direct oral anticoagulant class of medications do not require monitoring safety and efficacy have been evaluated in administrative data which is in addition to clinical trials leading to us fda approval each direct oral anticoagulant drug has its unique properties with respect to half life renal clearance and availability available pharmacologic reversal agent patients who have been in atrial fibrillation for more than 48 hours and are not adequately anticoagulated electrical or pharmacologic cardioversion should be delayed until appropriate measures are taken to reduce the thromboembolic risk there are two approaches is to reduce the thromboembolic risk in these patients the conventional approach is to administer oral anticoagulation for at least 3 weeks before electrical or pharmacologic cardioversion the second approach is transesophageal echocardiogram guided electric cardioversion method when cardioversion cannot be postponed or an expedited approach is preferred in such cases once a therapeutic level of anticoagulation has been achieved with an oral agent intravenous heparin or subcutaneous and oxaparin It is ट्रायल As well as in a large randomized multi-center trial known as the assessment of cardioversion using transesophageal echo or acute trial.
oral anticoagulant should be continued after cardiac angiogram prescribes to allow the arterial transport mechanic key guided approach with intravenous heparin as the method of anticoagulation it is it is advisable to continue intravenous heparin until therapeutic oral anticoagulation is achieved the decision to initiate and continue anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation shorter than a duration of 48 hours should be based on the presence of other risk factors from embolism subgroup analysis from really trial rocket atrial fibrillation trial and aristotle trial so one non proprietary study on account of the left atrial appendage accounting for the source of most thrombus in patients with non valvular atrial fibrillation several interventions gave uh, interventions have been designed for left atrial appendage closure and thus stroke reduction <laughs> The watchman device, a closure device deployed percutaneously that blocks the left atrial appendage, has been approved by FDA for stroke prevention in patients with non-valvular AF who are at an increased risk of stroke and who have no contraindications to short-term anticoagulation. Restoration and maintenance of sinus rhythm. the restoration so it bothers some symptoms however management of patients with asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic af has been controversial for many years selecting appropriate patients for a rhythm controlling strategy are well articulated by clinical practice guideline in addition to improving the symptoms the potential benefits of restoring and maintaining sinus rhythm include Evidence of the development of atrial cardiomyopathy from ongoing atrial fibrillation, improvement in heart failure, and improved overall quality of life. A rhythm control strategy often requires the use of antiarrhythmic drugs that may have significant and even life-threatening side effects, and procedures that carry uncommon but potentially life-threatening or disabling complications. Some non-randomized trials have reported an increase in mortality among patients who are on long-term antiarrhythmic drugs of the drug. In addition, randomized studies have compared the treatment strategy of ventricular rate control or duration. to minimal or no symptoms during atrial fibrillation the fm trial was a large multi center randomized study that compared drug control and rhythm treatment strategies used appropriate anticoagulation strategy according to established guidelines this study demonstrated that a rhythm control study strategy is no better than a ventricular rate control strategy with regard to quality of life in cases of stroke or mortality at a follow up of only rhythm strategies including more than 5000 patient and demonstrated that a rate control strategy is not inferior to rhythm control strategy the studies comparing catheter ablation with antiarrhythmic drug therapy as an initial approach to af control have yielded some promising results ongoing large multi center randomized trials like the catheter ablation versus antiarrhythmic drug therapy for atrial fibrillation trial tebana trial and early treatment of atrial fibrillation for stroke prevention trial should provide more insight regarding catheter ablation versus antiarrhythmic drug therapy acute near restoration of sinus rhythm may be achieved with either pharmacologic or electric cardioversion it is important to remember that electrical and pharmacologic cardioversion are no different with regard to the risk of thromboembolic stroke therefore the requirements for anticoagulation apply equally to either treatment strategy thromboembolic risk profile discussed previously direct current electric cardioversion electrical cardioversion is more effective it done 
the success with the ability and in the presence of personal skill in area management the administration of an anti arrhythmic drug may promote most success direct current cardio version and subsequent maintenance of sinus rhythm for any patient who develops an early atrial fibrillation recurrence after direct current electric cardio version and to consider a repeat attempt after the drug has been initiated and reaches steady state blood levels pharmacologic cardio version rates of successful immediate cardio version by pharmacologic means have raised from 40% to 90% with success more likely to come for patient with atrial fibrillation option. Contemporary use of pharmacologic cardioversion in the US occurs in non-selective scenario in the emergency department or intensive care unit and also in stable outpatients treated with a unique type of rhythm control strategy referred to as a pill-in-the-pocket approach. Elective pharmacologic cardioversion is uncommon in the US given the superiority of a planned electric cardio version under sedation with the appropriate airway management personnel on hand. The intravenous agents approved for immediate pharmacologic cardio version of atrial fibrillation are propenamide, amiodarone, and ibutylide. Amiodarone is the most commonly used drug in emergency department and intensive care unit setting. Pharmacologic conversion of AF can be achieved with oral drugs. The pill in the pocket approach is sometimes used with class 1 C drug like plicanid or profenone and may be useful for selected outpatients in order to quickly avoid the actual fibrillation episode shortly after its onset. This approach has the potential to reduce emergency department visits and hospitalization but must be carefully initiated and supervised. It is recommended that the first such application of the environment, such as in emergency department, in order to establish the patient specific safety. Now, agents for immediate pharmacologic cardioversion for actual fibrillation. Proconamide. Not used frequently nowadays, but we should know something about it. Intravenous dose 20 to 50 milligram per minute or 100 milligram every five minutes until the arrhythmia is controlled. Hypotension can occur, URS complex can wide by 50%. Maintenance is 1 to 4 milligram per minute. It can achieve therapeutic levels quickly. Half life elimination is 2 to 5 hours. Rapid administration may cause hypertension. Up to 10% patient with congestive heart failure may experience forced heart failure. Procanamide is rarely used as there is no longer an oral product. Amiodarone, intravenous form, 150 to 300 milligram given over 10 to 120 minutes. Depending on tolerance of blood pressure, maintenance infusion at 0.5 to 1 milligram per minute. Oral form, 600 to 800 milligram daily in divided doses until 10 gram total. Maintenance dose is 200 milligram daily. It can be used in patients with severe left ventricular dysfunction. Its half-life elimination is 25 to 120 days. Drug interactions are common with amiodarone. Long-term use associated with many side effects. Incidence of torsed D point is higher than with procanamide. Ibutylide, intravenous form, 1 mg bolus, can repeat after 10 minutes if no effect. Use lower dose. Impaired use in patient with baseline prolongation of QT interval. Few extra cardiac side effects. Incidence of prostate deformities is higher with flicanid. Uh, sorry, ibutylid. 
Anti-arrhythmic drug therapy for maintenance of sinus rhythm. Many oral agents are available for long-term maintenance of sinus rhythm in patients with atrial fibrillation. Plus one anti-arrhythmic drugs like quinidine, propenamide, and dystopyramide have become less commonly prescribed than in the past because of their side effect profiles. The class 1C agent, namely flicanid and profophenone, have more favorable side effect profiles and are more commonly utilized. However, the use of this medication does have some degree of risk. The cardiac arrhythmia suppression trial has shown that flicanid and ankanid are associated with an increase in mortality when used for the suppression of ventricular arrhythmia in patients who have had a myocardial infarction with ventricular dysfunction. As a result, there is much concern about the use of plus one C antiarrhythmic in patients who have any type of underlying coronary artery or structural heart disease. Flicanid and profofenone are usually well tolerated. And are appropriate for line of the or mark the existing conduction diseases that is complete left bundle branch block. Such as sodium channel blockers are expected to widen the QRS complex, thereby increasing the vulnerability to heart block. Among the antiarrhythmic drug, unindine is not used nowadays. Flicanid. Dose of flicanid is 50 to 200 milligram once every 12 hours. Generally, oil tolerated significant incidence on nervous system. Avoid use in patients with coronary heart disease or shown to increase the mortality when used to suppress the ventricular arrhythmia in patients after myocardial infarction. Typically need to combine with an avinodal blocking agent. Profafenone, immediate release, 150 to 300 milligram every eight hours, and extended release, 225, 325, or 425 milligram every 12 hours. It is generally oil tolerated, twice daily extended release from results in more stable blood level. Three times daily dosing, avoid use in patients with coronary structural heart disease and patients with bronchospastic lung disease. Amiodarone, 100 to 200 milligram once daily. Sir, do you have a Yes, sir. Hello. Hello. Did you hear me, sir? Everybody is not attentive to listen to the lecture. Dose of amidoron, 100 to 200 milligram once daily. It can be used in patients with coronary structural heart disease. Half life elimination is 120 days. Many side effects with long term use baseline chest x ray, liver function test, thyroid function test should be performed. Approved only for life threatening ventricular area, but is still often used for atrial or supraventricular arrhythmia. Sotalol 40 to 160 milligram once every 12 hours can be used in patients with coronary structural heart disease. Beta blocking properties allow single agent therapy for almost all arrhythmias, causing QTC prolongation. Use limited by side effects related to beta blocking properties. Renally cleared, avoid use in patients with moderate to severe renal dysfunction. Inpatient telemetry recommended for initiation of therapy. Dofetilite, 125 to 500 mics every 12 hours. Generally well tolerated, few extra, few extra cardiac effects, but can be used in patients with coronary or structural heart disease. Requires monitored initiation in hospital. 
use of or of taxation of rate controlling antiarrhythmic medication. Pacemakers are also implanted in conjunction with catheter ablation of the AB node. This type of ablation is the ultimate method of ventricular rate control and is often reserved for patients with permanent or the potential benefit of this type of is simply controlling the angular rate, particularly in triple pacemaker. This approach has been shown to be effective and leads to improved quality of life for patients. However, this approach does not address the fibrillating atia. And such patients still require systemic anticoagulation for thrombembolism and stroke prevention. Several features of pacemaker system may be useful for patients with atrial fibrillation. A pacemaker that has the capability to change automatically into a non checking pacing mode at the onset of an episode of atrial fibrillation, known as mode switching, is essential to avoid the rapid heart rate that might otherwise occur when the pacemaker responds to rapid atrial activity by pacing the heart inappropriately fast in the ventricle. Implantable atrial defibrillators have been developed. Either as a standalone device or in combination with a ventricular fibrillation. Patients are physician. Catheter ablation. Catheter ablation has emerged as a safe and effective alternative. When for the maintenance of sinus rhythm, a stroke or heart failure, and thus is not regarded as a substitute for a stroke prevention. Conceptually, a standard catheter ablation approach involves given the importance of actual ectopy originating from the pulmonary veins in atrial fibrillation-related pathogenesis, post-ablation, spontaneous electrical impulses originating from within any of the four pulmonary veins cannot propagate into the atrial body to initiate or trigger atrial fibrillation. Pulmonary vein isolation is thus a stand-alone treatment approach, but has also been incorporated into larger ablative efforts aimed at non-pulmonary vein triggers and sub Modification. include other focal sources, tail tissue that sustain a tail fibrillation, includes mapping and ablation of complex fractionated electrograms, denervation of cardiac ganglionic complexes, cardiac ganglionic plexuses, and most recently, mapping and ablation of tail fibrillation rotors. Substrate modification or ablation of non pulmonary vein triggers are often incorporated into procedures for patients with persistent or long standing persistent AF. Outcome data suggests that pulmonary vein isolation alone with substrate modification works best for patients with persistent AF remains unclear after the recent STAR atrial fibrillation 2 trial showing no reduction in the rate of recurrence after extensive ablation. Published one-year efficacy rates of AF ablation range from 66% to 86% in randomized control trials comparing ablation to antiarrhythmic drugs or rate control agents. Refinement in techniques have resulted in a lower incidence of complication, notably pulmonary vein stenosis, which was common in the early era of catheter ablation. Experienced centers have reported high rates of successful AF ablation, resulting in discontinuation of antiarrhythmic drug therapy. The ideal candidate is a patient with paroxysmal AF in the absence of structural heart disease. In virtually all studies involving catheter ablation, Efficacy rates are lower among patients with persistent AF and long standing persistent AF. The degree of actual myopathy, scar burden, and comorbidities may also influence the outcome. 
weight loss strategy for patient with obesity and treatment of sleep and sleep apnea are recognized as increasingly important in clinical outcomes there are currently two different energy sources in use for the purpose of catheter ablation the more commonly used radio frequency catheter radio frequency current leads to tissue death by heating and is applied using a point by point method cryoablation uses cryogenic energy delivered in a single step by means of a balloon resulting in preparing the two energy sources concluded that cryoablation was not inferior to radio frequency ablation with respect to efficacy and in patients with drug refractory paroxysmal af the fire and ice trial also did not find any significant difference in overall safety between the two methods however phrenic nerve injury was more common in cryoablation group while such phrenic nerve injury is typically resolved spontaneously it may take up to one year and can be associated with significant morbidity other procedure related complication include serious events such as a stroke acute pulmonary vein stenosis persistent pulmonary vein stenosis cardiac tamponade thromboembolism serious esophageal injury and death more common typically not life threatening complication include femoral vascular related complication requiring intervention or delayed hospital discharge procedures typically take 4 to 6 hours involve the use of radiation x ray and have an expected hospital course of overnight observation to plan discharge the next day recurrence of af after a blanking period of 3 months post ablation may indicate recovery of pulmonary vein conduction and can be an appropriate indication for repeat ablation or anti arrhythmic therapy oral anticoagulation is recommended for at least 3 months following ablation and thereafter based on the individual patient risk for a stroke experience centers such as cleveland clinic have reported freedom from atrial fibrillation rates of 75% to 80% at one year for patients not taking anti arrhythmic drugs with paroxysmal af following a single catheter ablation and 85% to 90% following a second ablation ablation due to recovery in the pulmonary veins the presence of non pulmonary vein triggers or advanced atrial substrate or myopathy outcome for patient with persistent and long standing persistent af for lower than for patient with paroxysmal disease and reported one year efficacy rates between 50% and 70% following a single procedure and 70% and 80% following a second procedure surgical The original Cox surgical fibrillation has substantially increased its initial one. In the series of positions, patient that these are the normal of the actual tissue activity. and the magnitude of the spectral vision for using bipolar radio frequency cryotherapy or microwave energy outcomes associated with surgical approach are comparable with catheter ablation reported higher in some cases हेलो
কাগজ কলম থাকে তাহলে তোমরা একটু নোট করে রাখো যেহেতু আর স্লাইড দেখানো যাচ্ছে না অলরেডি ওয়ান আওয়ার ফিনিশ আই ওয়ান্ট টু সে আর ইউ রেডি ইনসামেশনালিম ibutylide or sotalol is very much effective if lv systolic function is preserved it is in uh, particularly important in case of uh, cavg surgery and uh, following uh, valvular surgery uh, to control the atrial fibrillation in post operative period uh, treatment of atrial fibrillation in acute myocardial infarction setting in acute setting direct current cardioversion if injectable ischemia or hemodynamic instability and number 2 intravenous beta blocker for rate control anticoagulant if atrial fibrillation persists and uh, this is treatment of atrial fibrillation in acute mi setting number 3 atrial fibrillation and wpw syndrome it is very important please keep note about beta blocker non dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker and digoxin as this may facilitate to develop ventricular fibrillation because when we block the ab node by beta blocker calcium channel blocker or digoxin then there is uh, uh, uncontrolled conduction of uh, uh, atrial um, uh, atrial impulse through the accessory pathway to ventricle which leads to ventricular fibrillation so we will avoid beta blocker non dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker and digoxin in patient of atrial fibrillation with wpw syndrome in this case Uh, if patient is hemodynamically unstable we will give direct current cardioversion then we will treat the patient with radio frequency ablation but if patient is hemodynamically stable and patient have no structural heart disease we will treat such patient with flicany class 1 c antiarrhythmic drug now uh, now and now atrial fibrillation in, pre- in pregnancy atrial fibrillation in pregnancy may develop in certain condition particularly mitral valvular diseases in this case uh, we will control the ventricular rate with beta blocker or non dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker or digoxin and uh, antiarrhythmic drugs uh, can cross the placenta and also excreted in breast milk and it should be avoided uh, although in some studies it is shown that amiodarone sotalol and flicanid um, is used successfully uh, without any uh, much more side effect now atrial fibrillation in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy uh, atrial fibrillation in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy beta blocker or non dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker for rate control and disopyramide disopyramide is used for rhythm control in atrial fibrillation with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy although it has some few side effects like urinary retention or constipation Uh, oral anticoagulant warfarin should be given to all patient with atrial fibrillation with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy uh, uh, to keep the INR to to free or we can use the newer oral anticoagulant without monitoring the uh, INR atrial fibrillation with ARA disease like bronchial asthma or COPD we should use non dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker now uh, um in an axial how can we maintain the sinus rhythm in note if patient have no structural heart disease or minimal heart disease we should use flicanid profofenon or sotalol flicanid profofenon or sotalol if no structural or minimal structural heart disease if rhythm is not controlled or not conducted to sinus we can go to amiodaron or dofetilide amiodaron or dofetilide if not controlled we will go for ready frequency ablation ekta ekhon theke rasta shomoy lage chhuti jore ekhon lateral room e pore jani ashe 
What about you? Hello, do you listen? No, no. Hello? 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 Yes, sir. Uh, do you listen? Are you in contact? Hello? Sir, I'm listening, sir. Okay. Uh, so, how can we maintain sinus rhythm? I have already told, if no structural heart disease or minimal heart disease, we can need propofenone or sotalol for restoration of sinus rhythm. If not restored, we will use the amiodarone or dofetilide. If not restored, we will use radio frequency ablation. Okay. okay. Then, uh, if patient atrial fibrillation, patient of atrial fibrillation having hypertension, but no left ventricular hypertrophy in echocardiogram, then we will use flicanid, profofenone, or sotalol to maintain the sinus rhythm. If not maintained, we will use amiodarone or dofetilide. If not maintained, radio frequency ablation. If hypertension is associated with left ventricular hypertrophy, then we will use only amiodarone, not flicanate, profopenone, or sotalol. If patient have hypertension with left ventricular hypertrophy, we will use amiodarone. If amiodarone cannot restore sinus rhythm, we will go for radio frequency ablation. If patient have coronary artery disease and atrial fibrillation, we will use amiodarone or sotalol or dofetilide. Never class 1 or class 1A or class 1C drug. Only amiodarone, sotalol or dofetilide for coronary artery disease with atrial fibrillation. If sinus rhythm is not maintained or not restored, we will use radio frequency ablation. If patient has congestive heart failure with atrial fibrillation, we will not use class 1 or class 1C antiarrhythmic drug. We will use amiodarone or dofetilide. We will use amiodarone or dofetilide. If not, Restored to sinus rhythm will go for radio frequency ablation. You, uh, you should keep it in uh, your lip. Now, you will ask in your exam hall what is known atrial fibrillation? Known atrial fibrillation is defined as atrial fibrillation occurs in patients under the age of 65 years without any structural heart disease. Lone atrial fibrillation is atrial fibrillation occurs in patient under the age of 65 years without any structural heart disease. Now, what are the high risk for thromboembolic stroke in atrial fibrillation? Please keep it in note. Number one, history of a stroke or transient ischemic attack. Number one, history of a stroke or transient ischemic attack. Number two, rheumatic mitral stenosis. Rheumatic mitral stenosis. These two are high risk factor for thromboembolic stroke in patient with atrial fibrillation. And other are moderate risk. What are the moderate risk? Age more than 65 years. Age more than 65 years. Female gender, congestive heart failure, coronary artery disease, hypertension, diabetes mellitus, and chronic renal failure. What are the contraindication of anticoagulant in atrial fibrillation? Although it is very much essential to prevent the thromboembolic stroke. What are the contraindications? Number one, history of hemorrhagic stroke. Number one, history of hemorrhagic stroke. Number two, recurrent gastrointestinal bleeding. Number two, recurrent gastrointestinal bleeding. Number three, subdural hematoma. Number three, subdural hematoma. In these three situations, will not advocate anticoagulant in a patient of atrial fibrillation, although there is a high chance of thromboembolic stroke. So what will you do? We will do surgical amputation of left atrial appendage. We will do surgical amputation of left atrial appendage or percutaneous occlusion of left atrial appendage or percutaneous occlusion of left atrial appendage by watchman device. Watchman device. Keep it in mind. When we will get a slow heart rate in atrial fibrillation, when ventricular rate is less than 80 per minute, when ventricular rate is less than 80 per minute at rest and less than 115 per minute during exercise, 
what is actual fibrillation with a slow heart rate that is when ventricular rate less than 80 per minute at chest or more, less than 115 per minute during exercise when we will get actual fibrillation with a slow heart rate it is found in patient with depressed AV node function it is found in patient with depressed AV node function or patient is getting MP or patient is getting AV nodal blocking drug Higher thrombus commonly formed in atrial fibrillation. Thrombus commonly formed in left atrial appendage. You, you will ask why? Because in left atrial appendage, there is reduced blood flow due to loss or ineffective mechanical contraction of left atrium. When mechanical contraction of left atrium is decreased or lost, there is reduced blood flow to left atrial appendage. These left atrial appendage become the uh, site for thrombus formation. Before thrombus formation, we may get a spontaneous eco-contrast in left atrium. What is a spontaneous eco-contrast? This is the clumped RBC and plasma protein. Clumped RBC and plasma protein. A spontaneous eco-contrast found in left atrium is the clumped RBC and plasma protein. And this spontaneous eco-contrast may not disappear after anticoagulant may not disappear after anticoagulant or in sinus rhythm, especially when LA is dilated. What test can predict the development of thromboembolic stroke in patient with actual fibrillation? This is increased serum level of bone only brand factor. Increased serum level of bone only brand factor. What are the hemodynamics occur in actual fibrillation? In atria, listen to me. Loss of mechanical atrial contraction. Number one, loss of mechanical atrial contraction. Loss of AB synchrony. Loss of atrioventricular synchrony. Then there is increased left atrial diastolic pressure. Increased left atrial diastolic pressure, which leads to pulmonary edema with or without hypotension. Increased ventricular rate. Increased ventricular rate, which leads to decreased diastolic period. This decreased diastolic period leads to decreased coronary flow. This decreased coronary flow leads to chest pain in patient with actual fibrillation. What are the, what are the um, conditions you have to differentiate from actual fibrillation from other arrhythmia in ECG? Number one, actual flatter. What is actual flatter? It is characterized by rapid and regular actual rate. Rapid and regular atrial rate, usually more than 240 per minute. Characterized by short tooth, inverted flutter rate in lead 2-3 ABF. Characterized by short tooth, inverted flutter rate in lead 2-3 ABF. And upright flutter rate in lead B1. In typical form of atrial flutter, which is activated by counterclockwise fashion. In atypical atrial flutter, reverse, reverse format of flutter rate is found. And what are other conditions we have to differentiate from actual fibrillation in ECG? Another one is actual tachycardia. Actual tachycardia is a supraventricular tachycardia that usually has a sudden onset and offset with a pioid morphology, with a pioid morphology that is typically different from sinus rhythm. And we have to differentiate another condition which is called multifocal actual tachycardia. What are the characteristics of multifocal atrial tachycardia? There are at least three distinctive PO morphology in same lead. At least three distinctive PO morphology in same lead. Isoelectric baseline between the PO. Isoelectric baseline between PO. Irregularly irregular rhythm. Irregularly irregular rhythm with variable PP interval, PR interval, and RR interval. And heart rate will be more than 100 beat per minute, usually 100 to 150 per minute. Do you listen? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, what are the newer oral anticoagulants? We commonly use Riveroxavan. What is the dose of Riveroxavan? 20 milligram per day. Dose of Riveroxavan, 20 milligram per day. And uh, what are the other newer oral anticoagulants commonly used? Devigatran. What is the dose of Devigatran? 110 milligram twice daily. 110 milligram twice daily. 
and the advantage of this newer oral anticoagulant is we have no need we have no need to monitor the, the um, uh, INR like warfarin or vitamin K antagonist. What physical findings you will get in actual fibrillation patient? You will ask in your exam hall. You will you must say there will be variation intensity of first touch sound. Variation intensity, variation in intensity of first touch sound. Number one. Number two, absence of a wave in jugular venous pulse. Absence of a wave in jugular venous pulse. Number three, significant pulses deficit. Significant pulses deficit when there is first ventricular wave. What is significant pulses deficit? Auscultated apical rate is faster than pulse palpated at test as each contraction is not sufficient to open the aortic bulge. And I think uh, um, time is over, and uh, uh, these are everything about atrial fibrillation. And if you have any question, you can ask me. Sir, I have to elaborate this shopping task question, sir. It is very important. Um, um, to mother, a for a long case among ECG by the board, a can take details on the chabet of a Jinjula Amit mother Bulbo, J. Tumla Jeta Mani Polaraki of it, Shetoche ECG diagnosis, give away Kurbo at number, give away differentiate Kurbo, multifocal actual tech study of actual photo take a teacher Jigishkurve, Polishkurve actual fibrillation at Poski, first Tamra Bulam J. ट्रीटमेंट I mean, not that the H. Shabaja di Polo, the act number of chair eight control, the number of chair to mark, um, the number of chair to prevent the thrombambolic stroke, or number three of chair restoration and maintenance of sinus rhythm, uh, Ebabijo di Bolo, or Ebabi Likia or Monojar, uh, Kubishiki Jigish Kurvena, Eteo Chasule Mudakota, or to a special situation, Jabon pregnancy, the Kibabi treatment for who a chair population patient. Cardiac surgery for a Johan Tomother came to the ICU to call the way the CAVG could say, Ottawa, Balbic West Police, a connected population developed for Sikiba with Kit Kurba, a patient group at Lagbeba, on a patient as way, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, basque, PD patient, other to the actual population target, I like Kiba, manage Kurbo, a bullet to Janaka Katalia, Kostani Monoshon Shogana. I reckon it's important to say WPW syndrome, a connected population. Jamra WPW, WPW to the active fibrillation near present for a Talamra popular beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, and digoxin Jabona, Tatamra, Jodi patient hemodynamically unstable, direct current cardioversion, or Jodi hemodynamically stable, Talapore Amra, I would really use put the party, Ottawa Jodi patient upon a structural heart disease Natake, Talamra Frike need to fasten on Ebula use put the party. Ito Chimutakota, I सर করেন আচ্ছা ঠিক আছে যদি তুমি তোমার এটা তোমাদের যারা ফেলো আছে এমডি ডি কার্ড এস ফেলো যারা আছে তারা যদি চায় তুমি তাহলে তাদেরকে শেয়ার করে দিও আর কি তোমার হোয়াটসঅ্যাপ এর মাধ্যমে কেমন আচ্ছা ঠিক আছে স্যার জি স্যার ঠিক আছে